open before us. Um, we will run through one or two things just to understand the text, understand what we're looking at, and then we'll have a message that tries and make that tries to make sense of how the Reformation helps us understand this passage, or maybe how this passage helps us to understand the Reformation and our own church and our own faith. If we go back to the first slide of the reading, Rayleigh. Um, so Jesus is in Jerusalem. He is in the temple and he's talking to the Jews. Now, not all of the Jews, but those Jewish people who had come to listen to him. Some had been intrigued by his ideas. Others had opposed him. And a few, it seemed, had come to believe that actually what he's saying is in line with what they believed about God. And so they're on the right track. But Jesus, knowing the depths of our hearts, immediately speaks to something in their faith that they need to take seriously. He says, if you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples. Now have a look. If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples. And at the same time, you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. John has this this funny way of writing. Um, if, you, if you read the Gospel of John in Greek, the sentences, some, the sentences sometimes come across as if they were written by a child. It's very stop-start, it's very staccato. But what he's trying to make us understand is that all these things go together. You can't have one of the four without focusing on each one. If you continue, the word they continue is abide. And you will know abide from John 15, abide in me, whoever abides in me abides in the Father, the whole story of the grape and the vine, abide in me, continue in me, remain in me. If you remain in my word, remember how John starts his gospel, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Not words here. Interestingly, Jesus is not saying, if you keep my words. He's saying, if you remain in my word, in me. Then you are truly my disciples. And not only that, but you will know the truth. And the truth will make you free. Now the Jewish people had been slaves in Egypt for 400 years. They knew the difference between being slaves and being free. More so probably than many of us. It was a part of their history the way we can probably not understand or imagine. This, this was centuries ago, but it was still crucial to their faith. And so much of what Israel was and what Israel had become was a fighting against being enslaved again because God had liberated them from Egypt never to subjugate them to another nation again. But of course, the Assyrians came along, the Babylonians came along, the Greeks came along, and now in this time, the Romans came along. And they ruled over Judah and over Israel. And so it's a... It's a, <laughs> it's a touchy subject for the Jews. If you say to them, you're not free, or you will be made free, their immediate emotional reaction will be, what do you mean we're not free? Of course we're free. It's, <laughs> it's, like, if you, um, it's like if your partner gets a bit riled up and you say, calm down. Uh, and, and they say, what do you mean calm down? I'm very calm. Um, it's a kind of reaction that the Jewish people are having here. We're descendants of Abraham, Jesus. We've never been slaves. We've always been free. They hear the word freedom and they think the way we think. They think political freedom, national freedom, military freedom, economic freedom. That's the image they have. And who are you to tell us that we are not free. Jesus says, well, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. Think about that image for a moment. 
If you're a slave to someone or to something, you almost don't have any other choice than to obey. If you're a slave to sin, then sin has a command over your life the way that a master has the command over his or her servant. You don't really get a choice in the matter. That's the, that's the, that's the depth of the sin that Jesus is discussing and putting on the table here. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. Yes, he may be there every day. He might live in quarters near the household. He may know the place better than the masters. But he can be sold any day. Or he can be beaten any day. Or he can be freed any day. Now, although he's in the house, the house does not belong to him. But the son has a place there forever. So now, if the Son makes you free, you are free indeed. Wonderful message of affirmation of what faith is and what it means for us. And this passage specifically has helped the Reformed Church always understand what faith is about. The Son makes you and I free. He liberates us from sin and from evil and from death. We don't do it ourselves. We don't rely on being the descendants of Abraham or any other nation. We don't rely on the fact that our parents raised us in the church or that we went to Sunday school. We don't rely on how often we come to worship or how much money we put in the offering bag or how good we are and what good deeds we do because God does not give rewards for faith faith is freely given in unconditional grace and love and acceptance by God to you and to me because we're so clever no because He loves us and He can do no other thing. God can do nothing other than love you and set you free. The sin that John talks about here, it's interesting, we spoke about the Gospel of Luke a few weeks ago and we said, in Luke, the sins are very well defined. Luke defines his sins. Tax collecting is a sin. Prostitution is a sin. Stealing is a sin. Murder is a sin. John takes a different perspective. John says, yeah, those things aren't good, but they're not really the sin. The sin is not believing in Christ. It's almost the sin before the sin, isn't it? John is saying, long before your actions bear out some kind of sinful deed or consequence, long before that, there's something deeper in your mind and in your heart and in your soul that leads to those actions, and that thing is the sin. That thing is what must be targeted. And John will say, it is summed up in unbelief. And now here's the dangerous part. It's not as simple as not believing in God. I would go so far as to say, that's, <laughs> that's easy. It's easy for people who aren't Christian to say, I don't believe in God. And, you know, fair enough. The danger, the complexity, exists within these four walls, where we do pledge our belief in Christ. The danger is this, that we say we believe in Christ plus something else. So we believe that we are saved by faith, but surely our good works count for something. We believe we are saved by grace, but surely our ancestry 
who our parents and our grandparents and Abram himself was, surely that counts for something with God. We are saved through Christ, but not Christ alone. I've got a part to play in my liberation as well. You see, for John, unbelief is not simply denying the existence or the agency of God. Unbelief for John is believing in yourself. Believing in yourself before and above believing in God. It goes further than that. Not just believing, but relying on yourself instead of relying on God. Now you might think, well Fritz, I don't do that. I don't rely on myself. I know myself pretty well and I'm, <laughs> and I'm not that great. But in the 16th century, the Catholic Church had a thing going uh, where they pretty much convinced people of how bad they were, how sinful they were, how damned they were, how reaching God or getting close to salvation was completely and utterly outside of their control and their agency. You can't beg God for forgiveness because you're too bad. But guess what? You can beg the Pope for forgiveness. And if you put enough money in the coffer, he'll make it happen. And so in the 16th century, all throughout Europe, the Catholic Church had a thing going. They wanted to pay for the finishing um, of the, um, what's the big one in Rome, the big chapel? Sistine. They wanted to pay for that to be finished. They needed a bit of a fundraising. They didn't have a plant and pastry sale, Hillary. <laughs> they went throughout the whole Europe. And they sold people forgiveness. They went town to town, village to village, saying to people, you know what? We're very sorry to hear about your father or your mother who passed away a few years ago. And you know, your father, he was a sinful man. He tried very hard, but at his, at, at his base, he was pretty bad. And, um, and he's suffering right now. He's being punished in the warm place for his sins. But if you make a small donation, the Pope will half his time in suffering. If you make a big donation, the Pope will cancel his suffering and his punishment altogether. Sounds good, doesn't it? And then they went further from there. And someone said to these traveling priests, he said, Well, hang on, hang on. If I can pay for someone who's already died to have their suffering nullified, can't I pay in advance for my own? And the priest said, yes, of course you can. Pay me now, so that when you die, you don't suffer in purgatory or in hell. And they made millions. And they made millions of this simple lie. I want you to hear this clearly. It's not that the Pope himself was evil. It's not that the priests were evil or somehow sent by Satan. It's that people, regular people like you and I, had begun to believe on a very deep level that somehow something I can do can guarantee my salvation. I can pay to be forgiven. There's a guy who is called the head of the church who has all authority over life and death, the Pope. And I can petition him by my wallet or by my good deeds to somehow secure my salvation. Do you hear the problem here? It's not that there was unbelief in Christ and then misguided belief in the Pope. It's that there was unbelief in Christ because there was misguided belief in the self. And so you had Martin Luther, a Catholic priest, um, went to university at 13 years old and got his doctorate in philosophy before he was 18. Brilliant. They called him the philosopher. That was his nickname. Became a Catholic priest, studied the scriptures, was convinced 
that God's wrath and God's damnation was for him specifically. Um, psychologists who read the story of Luther and who read his writings will tell us that he seems like he suffered from terrible bouts of depression which led to his anxiety about his salvation but he grew up in a church that proclaimed that, that wanted people to believe that your salvation was, was up to you you could live in such a way that God would not punish you. You could pay in such a way for your sins that God would somehow forgive them. He grew up in that system and it caused him the most terrible anxiety and he was going mad and insane with it. And then one day, it's not that he opened the book of Romans, it's that God opened the book of Romans to him and he read there, we are justified by grace through faith we are not justified by the Pope or by the church or by the pastor we are not justified by our money or our good deeds or who our parents were we are justified by the grace of God and it completely changed his worldview and he began to realize just how corrupt the church around him had become and his goal was never to destroy the church or to destroy Europe. His goal was to go to the Catholic Church and say, I have discovered something in the scriptures that we need to re-examine. And so in 1517, on Sunday the 31st of October, he wrote down 95 theses, 95 things he wanted to debate the Catholic Church on. And he went to the church in Wittenberg where he lived and he hammered them to the door and he left them there for people to read so that he could start a discussion that might uh, improve and benefit the whole church. And the Catholic Church wanted none of it. They saw him as one who would destroy the whole world around them by taking away their authority. This is the message. If they had CNN, this is what they would have put on the, um, on the screen. Local man unknown nobody destroys the very fabric of society takes away the authority of those who are in power and so they say to Luther we'll invite you to um, we'll invite you to a uh, to a debate with a holy Roman Emperor we want to hear what you have to say and so he went to the German town of Worms to go have this debate. And we'll get to what he said there um, in a second. But just for a moment, if we, if, if we just return to, 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 to what we're talking about. In this reading, Jesus says, If you remain in me, if you abide in me, if you abide in my word, then you are truly my disciples. Disciple simply means learner student and you will learn the truth and the truth will make you free when John uses the word truth he means it in opposition to the word law think about the Jewish way of life and how they lived according to the laws of the Old Testament and how they believed that if you kept the law the law would make you free what is that that is again relying on my own ability to keep the law for my salvation but Jesus in the Gospel of John says instead of the law see the truth and the truth is not God's wrath it's God's grace see the truth that abiding in God's Word is worth more than abiding in your works see the truth that abiding in God's glorification that's the that's one of those five solas we spoke we spoke about soli dio gloria glory to God alone living every second of your life thinking to yourself how can I best glorify God in this moment that is better than relying even a little bit on yourself for your own happiness pleasure existence survival or indeed salvation this is what the reformation comes down to a recalibration of how we see God 
and see ourselves in relationship to him. I want to stand still for a moment, this thing about self-reliance. Uh, John Piper, who's, a, who's still alive, um, good writer, good theologian, good preacher. The most dangerous thing in the world is the sin of self-reliance. The most dangerous sin we can commit is the sin that convinces us in the back of our minds that actually we've got this. Actually, we're in control. Actually, although the whole world is on fire, we can still pull a rabbit out of a hat. This is the sin at the core of all sins. A bit of a digression, but this is, in a sense, this is the sin, this is, this is the first sin in the garden. Adam and Eve, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and they cannot and must not eat of it, and the serpent says, well, if you do, what will you gain? Self-reliance. If you rely on your ability to take this fruit and eat this fruit and gain this knowledge, you will become like God. That, that is the sin. The sin is not eating the fruit. That's minor. The real sin is that self-reliance that we are tempted with every single moment. And I think a big part of the Reformation was not a rebellion against the Catholic Church. And I think a big part of Jesus' movement was not a rebellion against the Jewish faith. It was a rebellion against the sin of self-reliance and the temptation to rely on yourself instead of relying on God. I will We'll get to that later. So Luther goes to the Diet of Worms. He goes to have a discussion and a debate with the Holy Roman Emperor. But when he gets there, they put a gun to his head. Not really, but figuratively. And they say to him, you will recant of everything you have said. Or you will be excommunicated and worse. And they have a debate for days on end. And Luther answers all their questions. And he answers all their accusations. He answers them from scripture, not from his own knowledge. And then at the end, when they say to him, recant and do it now. He says to them, I cannot choose but adhere to. Or maybe this, I cannot choose but remain in. Abide in. The Word of God. That's John chapter 8. Which has possession of my conscience. That's truth. When the Word of God takes possession of your conscience, then you see the truth of creation. Nor can I possibly, nor will I even make any recantation, since it is neither safe nor honest to act contrary to conscience. And then these well-known words, here I stand, I can do no otherwise. So help me God. Amen. Perhaps that statement can sum up the reason we have a church today in which we have our own Bibles to read. And our own songs to sing. And our own deep personal relationship with Christ that requires no mitigation or mediation or a pope or a priest or a pastor or anything else. It is because we as individuals can go to God now in this moment and say to Him, Lord, here I stand. I can give you nothing. I cannot, I cannot do otherwise. So help me, God. Amen. If that is not the prayer of the Reformation, I don't know what is, friends. You can say Reformation happened 500 years ago. It's not that important anymore. Well, I think the Reformation is incredibly important. Even now, maybe especially now. 
because it calls us to continually inspect our own hearts and ask where are we committing that sin of self-reliance again where are we saying to our, to each other in church yes 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 christ alone but or yes 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 grace and faith in christ and scripture and god plus what i can bring to the table the reformed church is always reforming we never say we've got the answer that's the that is the absolute beauty of our tradition whether you are dutch reformed or methodist or presbyterian or congregationalist or something in between we never think we have it right because the truth of the matter is we probably don't if you wanted to add uh, another pillar to those five in the reformed tradition so if you had grace alone faith alone christ alone scripture alone glory to god alone if you wanted to add a sixth you might add you might be wrong if you wanted to write that at the top page of your bible that would be a good line keep reminding yourself regardless of what you think you might be wrong and you might have to delve into the word of god again to root out that sin of self-reliance so that you can stand with martin luther and with all believers throughout the ages and say here i stand i cannot do otherwise so help me god amen and perhaps we're running out of time perhaps that is our prayer as well so there's two more things to do worship team of you come to the front right before we sing i'd like you to do a confession with me um, and this is perhaps not so much from the um, methodist or presbyterian tradition but it is more from the dutch reformed tradition um, you might be more familiar with something like the westminster confession but this is the heidelberg catechism so when this new reformed church started coming together and saying well how do we understand our faith and how do we how do we articulate our faith for the people around us this is the first question they asked and the first answer they gave so if you stand with me i will ask the question and then we will read the answer together as a confession of what we have heard in god's word what is your only comfort in life and death that i am not my own but belong with body and soul both in life and death to my faithful savior jesus christ he has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from all the power of the devil he also preserves me in such a way that without the will of my heavenly father not a hair can fall from my head indeed all things must work together for my salvation therefore by his holy spirit he also assures me of eternal life and makes me heartily willing and ready from now on to live for him we have been set free not by our own devices not by our own cleverness but by the son of god alone let us sing our salvation together <clears throat>